my name is Nancy Stably, and I am an eyewitness scientist. So I thank you for the invitation to speak today about the science of eyewitness memory and the uh, science of eyewitness identification evidence. In another segment of this webinar, you will have heard uh, Police Chief Bill Brooks from Massachusetts talk about the best practices that exist for eyewitness evidence collection for police. I'm going to step back and take a look at the underlying science that provides the foundation for those practices. So what I will cover in my segment are some of the essential scientific principles, how we understand eye eyewitness memory to operate, and how we understand how um, eyewitnesses who are faced with an identification police lineup make those decisions. I will cover some factors that put the reliability of eyewitness evidence at risk, and then we'll see how the scientific understanding, these principles link to the recommendations for law enforcement that are in practice. A good place to start is simply to ask, well, what's the problem? And this problem has been made quite salient by the Innocence Project in their, to date, I believe 375 DNA exonerations. That is, these are individuals who were convicted of serious crimes, spent uh, uh, years in prison, and finally were exonerated through updated modern DNA technology that demonstrated that they were not guilty, that in fact, another person was guilty of the crimes. As eyewitness scientists have watched these DNA exoneration cases across the last few decades, we have noticed a very important um, fact, and that is that about 70% of the DNA exoneration cases are of individuals <clears throat> who were um, uh, convicted by testimony from eyewitnesses who got it wrong. Eyewitnesses who looked at a police lineup, made a selection of the police suspect, and these people were wrong. These real cases are very important to us because they provide direction for eyewitness scientists in terms of the kind of information that uh, we should pay attention to. For example, these DNA cases inform us about the circumstances under which errors occur. We can see that in these uh, wrongful conviction cases, these are traditional identification practices. That is typically the case detective develops a suspect, um, uh, brings that suspect in or produces a photo of the suspect, um, generates a lineup, delivers the lineup either in a, a form of photos, which uh, often called photo arrays, I'll also refer to it as photo lineup, um, or a live lineup, um, delivers that lineup to the eyewitness and then records the eyewitness's response. We also see in these um, DNA exoneration cases an important fact, and that is in all of these cases, the initial lineup that the eyewitness looked at was a lineup that of course included a police suspect, but the guilty culprit was not in the lineup. So we refer to these as culprit absent lineups. That is again, the police had a suspect, but it was an innocent suspect. Nonetheless, all of these eyewitnesses, and in some cases, multiple eyewitnesses um, for the same suspect, not only made a pick from the lineup, but they picked the police suspect. We also see that eyewitnesses in DNA exoneration cases typically have what we call confidence inflation over time. Even if the witness was not particularly certain about the identification decision at the time of the police lineup, we see that by the time that individual gets to trial, he or she is 100% sure. There's confidence inflation over time. And if you put yourself in a juror's perspective, of course, this makes sense then that you're looking at a person, often a victim of a horrible crime testifying on the stand and the eyewitness says that he or she picked this person, the defendant from the lineup and is 100% confident that particular testimony is extremely compelling. So the DNA cases inform us that well-intentioned Honest eyewitnesses can be very wrong and yet very convincing because they truly believe what they're saying on the stand. 
So this brings us to what I refer to as two perplexing problems, avenues of investigation for eyewitness scientists. First is, perplexing problem is, well, why does an eyewitness pick someone from the lineup when it's not possible that one of those lineup members match memory because the guilty culprit wasn't in the lineup? Why does that happen? And what we've seen through our laboratory studies is that one point, this is very predictable, is that eyewitnesses have a very difficult time recognizing the absence of the guilty culprit in the lineup. In other words, they want to find the guilty culprit. And if he or she is not in the lineup, their memories <laughs> have them work very hard to, to find a culprit anyway. A second perplexing problem that has become an avenue for eyewitness science research is, well, when an eyewitness gets it wrong, why does that eyewitness become so certain? And again, with our laboratory studies, as well as these DNA cases, we've seen very predictable pattern that confidence will increase after the identification. So a way to think about eyewitness evidence is to use the same framework as other types of forensic evidence, physical evidence. Um, all of you in the audience have certainly seen enough TV dramas and movies and such to know that when there's a crime, um, specialists enter the scene and they're very careful about how they collect physical evidence. Uh, they don't want to contaminate it. They don't want to mix samples. They don't want to lose it. So they use particular procedures that can um, uh, collect and, and store that evidence in a way such that it will not be degraded or lost. If you think about eyewitness memory in the same way as trace evidence, um, this can be very helpful to thinking about why these police practices are as recommended now. That is, the eyewitness has memory of the crime. It's, it's in that eyewitness's mind at the time after the crime exists. And the, and the point is that the police have to figure out some way of getting to that accurate memory without contaminating it, without losing it, and documenting it very, very well. So in this process of getting to that trace evidence, that memory of the eyewitness, what could possibly go wrong? I'm going to use uh, one of the DNA exoneration cases in order to illustrate this. And um, this audience, I understand, is made up of students. I want you to think for a while as if you are a psychological scientist, a budding scientist. And as I go through this John Jerome White case, I'd like you to think about, well, what kinds of factors do you think might be important here in helping us to understand eyewitness error? Which factors would you investigate? What kinds of hypotheses would you have about what produces eyewitness misjudgments? So this is the case that um, uh, came from an incident in 1979. Um, an elderly white woman at night was in her home and she was the victim of a home invasion, a burglary, and, and a horrible assault, a rape case. Um, she did not get a particularly good look at the um, intruder because it was dark. She didn't have on her prescription eyeglasses and he put a pillow over her face for the duration of the crime and, and she was not to take it off on her face until he went out the door. So she didn't, she didn't get a good look, but she um, called the police of course and gave her her, her best um, memory at the time of what this young uh, intruder looked like. The police put together a composite sketch. They um, had some leads come in and they developed six weeks after the crime, um, a suspect in John Jerome White. He is the fellow in the middle of this line of the young man in the white t-shirt. So the investigation progressed as, as this. Um, the police had a picture of John Jerome White. They put that picture in a photo array and the eyewitness, again, this is six weeks later, comes in. Um, she looks at the photo array. She's not sure, but she does point to John Jerome White. She thinks that that's possible. And so the police think it would be a good idea for the next week to, to put John Jerome White in a live lineup. And so they do that. They go to the jail, they find four other individuals who are in the jail who kind of match the description of the perpetrator. They put these 
these four fillers, we call them because we um, assume they're innocent of the crime, the fillers along with the suspect in a live lineup. And this vi the victim comes in and she doesn't take as much time. Um, this time around, she points to the individual in the white t-shirt and said, he's the one and she's positive. On the basis largely of that eyewitness testimony, then John Jerome White is convicted and he spends 27 years in prison for a crime he didn't commit. Um, at that point then 27 years later, DNA exoneration evidence shows that nope, he's not the criminal. But in an interesting twist to this story, just by coincidence, the fellow on the right side of this picture with the striped t-shirt or with the striped shirt, um, he just happened to be in jail on a different charge. Um, the DNA evidence 27 years after the fact that showed Mr. White to be innocent showed that this man was the perpetrator. So imagine the circumstance in which this woman who was the victim of this horrible crime looked at this lineup, did not recognize the actual perpetrator of the crime, but chose John Jerome White. Now, I'm hoping that you're thinking about all kinds of hypotheses about how this happened and how can we possibly investigate this. The central questions that we've had for science include these. First of all, how reliable is eyewitness memory? Is it never reliable? Is it always reliable? Somewhere in between. Um, if eyewitnesses make errors, why do they make errors? And then if we know how the errors occur, then can we possibly prevent them? So how do we answer these questions? Let me take a little bit of a, of a side trip here into eyewitness science. Um, like with any type of science, as with any type of science, whether you're a biologist or a chemist or a physicist, eyewitness scientists take a phenomenon that is extremely complex out there in the real world. And they bring it into the laboratory because that's where they can kind of disassemble it and try and figure out, well, what's important and what's not? How can we understand this? Uh, isolate through experimental trials, what causes what cause and effect. Um, that's a very useful procedure to establish principles about, in this case, eyewitness memory. It's really useful in the case of lineup um, procedures and eyewitness decision-making because when our participants come into the laboratory, we create the crime. The crime might be enacted in front of the participants. They don't know that it's, that it's an enacted crime. They think it's real, or they might view a video. I'll give you a chance to, to see something like that later in this presentation. And of course, because we created the crime in the laboratory, we know ground truth. We know who the perpetrator is and what he was wearing and how much lighting there was and whether or not he had a weapon and all such things. We also, when the witnesses then look at a lineup, we know whether the lineup includes the guilty culprit or an innocent suspect. So this is a very important way to establish principles for eyewitness memory. Um, and there are thousands of laboratory experiments. But again, just like scientists in other areas ultimately want to go back to the real world and see if these principles hold true. And so we also do experiments in the field that is go out and, and find inst instances of in which we can test real people who are experiencing a phenomenon. And we also have the benefit of archival data that is um, case studies such as the DNA exoneration cases and some um, wonderful absolute treasure troves of police reports that we can investigate in order to understand what real eyewitnesses do in the field. Let's go back to that first question I asked about, well, are eyewitnesses reliable? We find that there's no single rate of error. You can't say always reliable, never reliable. And the reason for that is, as we've seen in the laboratory, we can push the ID error rate around pretty easily. In other words, we can determine whether eyewitnesses are going to make more errors or fewer errors, or conversely stated, more accurate, less accurate, by changing circumstances of the crime, the lighting, the distance between the perpetrator um, and the eyewitness, whether there's a weapon involved, whether the offender is of a same or different race of the eyewitness, whether the offender is wearing a disguise, even a sunglasses or a hat, 
um, aspects of the witness. Is the eyewitness paying attention? Is the eyewitness intoxicated? What is the age of the witness? And of course, at the time of evidence collection, we can change the procedures, the instructions that are used um, for the eyewitness, the type of lineup that's provided. All of these many circumstances will change the error rate. And of course, the same is true in the field that there's so many different crime types and types of offenders and witnesses and circumstances. But from these, we can pull some general principles that seem to be reliable. In other words, they operate over and over and over. And let's talk about some of those right now. Why do eyewitnesses make errors was the second question. Um, think about John Jerome White, and you probably already have some good ideas about why these eyewitnesses are making errors. The victim in Mr. White's case um, was experiencing the crime at the time of the crime as the first stage of eyewitness memory. The witness is perceiving things that is seeing, hearing, touching, smelling. And some of those images, some of those fragments are going to be encoded. Encoding is the word we use to explain things that get into memory. But our memories are not, unfortunately, not like a YouTube or a video recording. What we encode are just bits and pieces, fragments. And of course, if you're not perceiving a, a great deal, as the victim in Mr. White's case um, couldn't see what was going on, it was too dark, her face was covered, et cetera, that means that not much is going to be encoded into memory. The memory strength in that case is rather weak. Once the crime is over, then we enter the phase of the police investigation. That is when police are trying to capture that memory, whatever memories there as trace evidence, how can we capture it? And that includes the important uh, stages of phases of retention. That is the memory must be stored over time and then retrieval brought back up into um, memory so that it can be reported. Um, problems at any of these stages of eyewitness memory can lead to errors. I believe um, Chief Brooks talked about factors that influence memory at the time of the crime as estimator variables. This is a term that eyewitness scientists use as well. And it refers to the fact that we have no control in the criminal justice system over these factors, such as lighting, whether or not there's a weapon, whether or not the, the perpetrator has um, a covering of his face. We can only estimate after the fact because investigators haven't even arrived on the scene yet. On the, other on the other hand, at the time of the investigation, we refer to influences on eyewitness memory as system variables because the system can take control to some extent over these factors when the interview, when the interview occurs, what kinds of questions are used when the eyewitness is interviewed, what kind of lineup is used. Um, again, thinking of that image as um, uh, memory as as trace evidence, how well can we get to that memory and store it and save it? Let's just talk a little bit about at the time of the scene, that is the memory strength. I usually categorize these factors into three general areas. One is the view. What kind of view did the eyewitness have? Um, and there are some hard limits here. You can't see around corners, you can't see through walls and the Mr. White's case, the woman had a pillow over her eyes. Um, and so we want to pay attention to what are obstacles to view? Um, what's the distance between the perpetrator um, and the eyewitness? What is the lighting like? Uh, is there a disguise or a facial covering? We also need to pay attention to the attention of the eyewitness on the face of the perpetrator. The duration of the crime is, is not the key factor here for identification evidence. It's how much time the eyewitness could actually look at the perpetrator. And any aspects of the crime that will divide attention, that will draw attention away from a perpetrator's face, this might be multiple perpetrators, action, a lot of action, a weapon that will draw attention from the perpetrator's face, that can diminish the likelihood that the eyewitness will encode memory and later make a correct identification. Similarly, if the witness is intoxicated or highly confused or stressed, um, these will all limit the ability to focus 
on, on the face of the perpetrator. And finally, um, can the witness comprehend what he or she is seeing? Is there comprehension of, of what's going on? Is there discernment of facial features? Um, we, we know from research that strangers are particularly hard to remember, to be able to discern their facial features, particularly if they've, if they've been seen only for a short period of time. And we know that faces of another race from our own are more difficult to discern in terms of facial features for memory purposes. This is um, one of my favorite, <coughs> excuse me, <laughs> studies to, to look at this issue of, of attention and comprehension. Um, Harvard researchers gave a series of lung scans to radiologists. The radiologists, of course, their job is to locate uh, scary things in lung scans like tumors and abnormal growths. And the radiologists were asked, of course, to identify anything unusual. Here is a lung scan where 83% of the radiologists who are smart folks um, didn't notice the gorilla in the upper right portion of the image. Does this mean they're um, not good eyewitnesses or they don't have good memories? No, they were just not looking for that particular kind of formation. And so they didn't even see it. They couldn't, they didn't discern it. They couldn't comprehend that it was there. Eyewitness evidence then should reflect our original memory or the witnesses <laughs> original memory for the crime event. But what we find is that, as I mentioned earlier, Memory is not like a YouTube video or videotape. Instead, we have bits and pieces of memory and the eyewitness tries to piece these together. Excuse me. Um, and the pieces that come together are then reconstructed. So it's not so much that eyewitnesses are retrieving whole memories, rather it's that they're reconstructing a memory using their current knowledge, what they've learned since the time of the crime. And so gaps in memory are filled with what they've learned, with their inferences, with their beliefs about what must be so, what must have happened, it only makes sense, um, and their expectations. And there's a, a, a lot of opportunity then for memory to be contaminated by what is learned from co-witnesses from uh, friends who question the eyewitness about what happened, well-meaning friends often, from uh, sources of, of the media. And this interesting phenomenon that we've seen more and more of lately, which is eyewitnesses to crimes or victims of crimes going online to the internet, to Facebook, to social media platforms, um, to offender databases, to try to find the perpetrator. And of course, all of these kinds of intersections with new images, new faces are going to potentially contaminate the memory for the original crime. And police procedures themselves may add unintended information inadvertently steering the witness toward believing certain things to thinking certain things are true about the perpetrator that perhaps was not part of original knowledge. Here's an, another example of a DNA exoneration case um, that I want to use to illustrate this point about how witnesses' memories are transformed after the event. This is the case of Ronald Cotton and Jennifer Thompson. Together, the two of them have written this book, um, cleverly titled Picking Cotton, because um, Jennifer picked Ronald Cotton from a lineup. This is a case of... Um, that originated when uh, Jennifer Thompson was um, a college student. And at night, there was an intruder into her home, um, a knife, um, a rape, a violent assault. And she, she was with the intruder for about a half hour before she was able to escape. Uh, she went to the police. Uh, the man was a stranger to her. So uh, she gave her best description that she could. She helped the police put together a composite sketch. The composite sketch drew a lead. Um, the lead was, oh, Ronald Cotton kind of looks like this composite sketch. So Ronald's um, photo was put into a photo array. Jennifer chose his photo after some period of time. Uh, subsequently, um, Ronald was put in a live lineup and uh, Jennifer chose him from the live lineup. They went on to trial. 
and he was convicted and spent um, a little over a decade before DNA evidence exonerated Ronald Cotton and pointed to the true perpetrator. Now, here's the point that I want to pay close attention to in this um, horrific case. New information to memory interferes with the original memory. And so think about Jennifer Thompson, who this is the man who assaulted her. This is Bobby Poole. This is the actual guy the DNA evidence pointed to after it was uh, finally tested. So this is the face she saw. Then very shortly thereafter, um, with the police, she helped to put together a composite sketch. That composite sketch now becomes part of her memory. It's a new experience. She's learned something new. It's, it's starting to transform her memory. She then looks at a photo array in which this picture of Ronald Cotton is present. And she, that becomes part of her memory, of course, as well, in that she looks at this, she makes the choice that this is the person um, who's the criminal. And then subsequently, she looks at Ronald Cotton in a live lineup. Just as with John Jerome White, all of the fillers change, lineup members change between the photo array and the live lineup. The only common denominator, the only person common to book, common to both the photo array and the live lineup is Ronald Cotton and she picks him. And her confidence grows because now she's picked him twice and the police are happy. They tell her, yep, that's the same guy you, you picked it from the photo lineup. And she feels a sense of that this, this is him, this is it. Her memory has changed such that in later years, um, as this, this case and a retrial was winding its way through the court, um, Bobby Poole was presented to Jennifer to see if in fact, maybe he could be the culprit. And she said she'd never seen that face before. Her memory was now um, of Ronald Cotton committing the crime, despite the fact that of course, now we know he didn't, Bobby Poole did. Now, I promised you that you would have a a process of identification yourself. I'm gonna show you a very short video and I'd like you to pay close attention so that you can then identify the perpetrator just so you get a, a sense of how this works. Okay, get ready and go. So you're working in your office, you look out the window and oh my, there's someone out there on the roof. Okay, you have that face in your mind now, and I'm going to ask you immediately to identify that face from a lineup, um, not next week, not next month, not a year from now, but when your memory is most fresh of all. Okay, uh, the lineup, and this is a, a video of a live lineup, so take a close look. Make your identity. Guess number one, you'll see number one. Okay, there you see the shot of the entire lineup. So now make your decision as to which one is the perpetrator you saw on the roof. And um, I'll give you the quick answer. Um, if you chose number one, or number two, or number three, or four, or five, or six, you're wrong. Um, this is a culprit absent lineup, as I talked about before. Now, if you made a choice from the lineup, um, think about how that memory experience worked for you, or even if you were leaning towards someone, think about what was going on in your mind as you, you worked with your memory to try and make a decision. And we want to talk about a process that's very common to eyewitnesses. It's called the relative judgment process. Perhaps you experienced it with that eyewitness lineup decision. We know from research that recognition memory, if you truly recognize someone, it's fast, it's automatic, or what we refer to as absolute. You just look at it face and you go, that's him, there he is. In the lineup you just saw, the perpetrator wasn't there. 
And so an automatic fast recognition memory is, 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 is not possible. Instead, if, if you don't really have a clear match to your memory, eyewitnesses slip into a different mode. They try to select the lineup member who looks most like the perpetrator relative to other lineup members. Figure out, well, which one's closest to my memory? That can work pretty well if the guilty perpetrator is in the lineup. But if the guilty person's not in the lineup, if it's a culprit absent lineup, and if the innocent, if the suspect is innocent and is perhaps in the lineup like Ronald Cotton because he looks kind of like the actual perpetrator, then you let, you've got a problem. The problem of relative judgment is that there's always a lineup member who looks more like the offender than the others, even in a culprit absent lineup. So think back to Ronald Cotton's case and the dilemma for Jennifer Thompson. Bobby Poole, the true offender, was not in the lineup. If he were in the lineup, he would have looked most like the offender because he was the offender. But without Bobby Poole, Ronald Cotton was at risk because he looked most like the offender. And this process of relative judgment that is so easy to slip into um, for eyewitnesses increases the risk for misidentification. This is a, a really simple idea, this difference between relative and absolute judgment. Absolutely recognizing a face versus kind of figuring out who it might be. It's a simple idea that has uh, been very useful as we've devised proper procedures for lineup structure and lineup delivery. Your students, and so I want you to think of a multiple choice test because this is kind of a, a similar principle. Um, if you've studied, if you really know the material, you've really cracked the book, you have this in memory, you know the answers, um, that to the questions. Um, you look at a multiple choice item, you read the stem of the question and you look at what are like four alternative answers. You just recognize the answer because you know the material. It, it, it's in your, your memory, there it is. And you can just say, oh, that's the answer right there at C. On the, and that's what we want eyewitnesses to do when they have a good memory to be able to just look at the lineup, look at options one, two, three, four, five, six and make a quick choice. But if they don't have a good memory. It's like if you went to a multiple choice test and you hadn't studied the material, if heaven forbid you hadn't even opened the book, then when you look at a multiple choice item, you go, oh boy, I don't recognize the answer, um, but I'm gonna figure it out. I'm gonna get credit. And so you might begin to look at the wording, features, words in those alternatives. You think, I think I heard, I think I heard the teacher say that, use that phrase, that, that must be right. Or maybe there are some you can rule out as less likely than others. And in the end, you make using relative judgment your best choice. We do not want eyewitness evidence to be based on a best closest choice on relative judgment. No, we want absolute judgment. One other, um, piece that I can add to this analogy of a multiple choice test is, you know that the teacher can really make the multiple choice test difficult by adding another option and that is none of the above. Then you really have to know the material. It makes it so difficult because you realize, well, none of the above might be the right answer. We do the same thing more or less in line of practice. And I'll talk about that in a minute. In order, the, the point is, to make sure that we're really testing for your memory. Um, starting with lineup structure. Um, we know, I'm gonna talk about the procedures now that, that are recommended based on these scientific principles. Of course, lineup structure is important. You want, just like this multiple choice, choice test, a good question to really tap memory. Um, all of the answers should be plausible but only if you have a good memory should you be able to recognize the answer. And so you've seen this kind of thing in cartoons all the way from Charlie Brown to Seinfeld to Peeps. Um, unfair lineups, lineups in which the suspect stands out and it's simply, they're simply not fair. So in terms of best practices, the first one has to do with lineup structure. There should be only one right answer per lineup 
right? Only one suspect per, per lineup. We hope that it's a guilty suspect, not an innocent suspect, but only one suspect per lineup. That suspect should be surrounded by five or more plausible fillers. And every lineup member should meet the description that the eyewitness has given of the culprit. Um, and the suspect should not stand out. So if the eyewitness says it was a really big guy, he reminded me of a pirate, then everyone in the lineup should look like a pirate or, or else the, the one person who does is at risk, um, particularly um, worrisome if, if this person is innocent. This is of course a bad lineup structure. Second, lineup procedure, how to deliver that lineup. The lineup administrator should not be the case detective. I mentioned earlier that the DNA exoneration cases involve the case detective who developed the suspect, developed the lineup and delivered the lineup. In the delivery of the lineup to the eyewitness should be done by a lineup administrator who does not know which lineup member is the suspect and which ones are fillers. That double blind practice helps to prevent any kind of even um, unintentional cues um, verbally from the lineup administrator or nonverbal cues, head nods, questioning that would steer the witness. We want this really to just be the test of the witness's memory. Another aspect of lineup procedure is what we call, we refer to as an unbiased cautionary instruction. Before the lineup, the lineup administrator says to the eyewitness, of course, we have some pictures we want you to look at, but the person that you saw, the person that did this to you may or may not be in this lineup. Um, that instruction helps the witness to realize that none of the above might be the right answer. And it, it really tamps down, it really um, helps to inhibit false identifications, mistaken identifications. The lineup um, is recommended to be sequentially presented. That is in order to not let the witnesses compare the pictures. We don't want the witness to compare and go, oh, which one's closest to my memory and start eliminating some, ruling out others. Instead, um, what scientists suggest is that the, the presentation should be sequential, one photo at a time. So the witness is comparing memory to a single photo, makes a decision and then goes on to the next one. And of course, response time should be documented. It's very important to, to consider how quickly the identification is made and how the witness verbalized that identification. If the witness is saying, well, I just don't know, but this one's closest, that of course is not a, a, strong, a, a strong identification. Documentation, uh, audio video, video of the entire procedure of the lineup identification should be done. And it's so important to take a confident statement from the eyewitness at that time of the ID before the witness can get any feedback or learn anything else about that case. Um, we, don't, we know from research that confidence can be related to accuracy under two specific conditions. Um, the confidence statement taken from the eyewitness should be at the, immediately at the time of the ID before any feedback and the, um, this confidence statement from the eyewitness should be from what we refer to as a pristine lineup procedure. In other words, one that's not suggestive, one in which the lineup is fairly constructed, a double blind administrator, proper um, lineup instructions and such. Um, and finally, you've learned this certainly from the Mr. White and Mr. Cotton's cases, do not show the same suspect to the same witness in multiple identification tasks. Only the first identification counts, first identification response. So let's return in kind of to these perplexing problems from early in the, in the presentation and, and now see what you've learned. Um, so the first question was, well, why does an eyewitness pick someone when the guilty person's not even in the lineup? And now you know why. Um, a number of possible answers. First of all, eyewitness memory is going to be partial at best. It's, it's not a videotape, it's, it's images, it's fleeting images, fragments. But at the same time, there's extreme pressure often on the eyewitness to try and remember and make sense of the experience. Some of that 
pressure to remember, self-imposed. People who've experienced um, traumatic events want to try and understand how did this happen and who's responsible. And some of that pressure is, is imposed um, externally by police, by investigators, by the media, by family and friends, well-meaning. The processes of memory are going to be a problem. The fact that memory is lost over time. The details disappear even in nine hours after the event. We see great loss of memory details by eyewitnesses. And memory will be contaminated across time as new things are learned. And finally, the procedures of memory collection can be very suggestive to the extent that police structure their lineups poorly or have um, non-blind lineup administrators and, and such uh, violations of best practices, this is going to aggravate the problem of misidentification by um, having witnesses rely on relative judgment or misplaced familiarity. That term misplaced familiarity refers to what we see in, in these multiple identification events where a witness sees now Ronald Cotton in the live lineup and says that that face is really familiar, but now has perhaps confused that face with, um, when did I see that face? Is, was it at the time of the crime? No, it was in the earlier lineup. Um, so all of these words, oh, I see they all, each phrase starts with a P, that'll make them easier to remember. It's a memory thing. Um, they produce identification error. The second problem that we talked about was why does an eyewitness become so certain even when a wrong identification is made? Um, bias procedures are a problem. If they're suggestive procedures, they make the eyewitness's decision feel easier. Uh, for example, if I'm looking at a lineup and expecting to see a, use, you know, a, a, a pirate and well, there's a pirate, um, it feels like the decision was easy, even if it's wrong, and that, that leads to false confidence. Witnesses are motivated, as I talked about, to believe that their decision is correct. They're gonna look for confirmation that they've made the right decision. And if they get feedback and new information that supports that decision, that bolsters the confidence. I think at this point, I'm about out of time. Oops, there we go. That produces false certainty. Now I'm out of time and I'm going to sign off and turn the program over to the next speaker. Thank you. All right, um, here we go. You have just heard one of the best lectures ever given on the <laughs> science of memory and the science of eyewitnesses. And with that background, I want to take you to the court system. And you see the box in the middle of this screen that says it's probably too little too late. Our courts do our best or their best to do justice. But what I'm going to suggest to you that courts are not the place to fix eyewitness error. They're not well designed for it. The laws are not well designed for it. And so the real lesson is we want to fix the problem of eyewitness error before we get to court, often with the types of reforms that you've heard discussed. So it turns out that a lot of us who lecture in this field use this photograph and the story of John White. And now you've heard it. And Mr. White's case is, of course, a personal tragedy to him, 20 plus years in jail. Um, and a reminder that the court couldn't catch this error. An error that's extraordinary since the real rapist was right in front of the victim and she, because of the changes in memory, could not see him. So I'm going to show you some language from a court decision. And it's not written in the most user-friendly way, but I'm gonna break it down. Without persuasive extrinsic evidence, and those words extrinsic evidence mean evidence apart from the eyewitness. For example, a robbery where I'm the robber and I left my driver's license at the robbery scene, 
that would be extrinsic evidence. But when you have a case without persuasive, strong extrinsic evidence, we really can't know for certain which identifications are accurate and which are false which are the product of reliable memories and which are distorted by one of a number of factors. These are not my words. These are the words of a state Supreme Court discussing the problems of eyewitness identification. And that's pretty scary when a unanimous group of judges say, we've got a problem here, we can't tell which eyewitness is right and which eyewitness is wrong. And if we had two trials going on now in two courtrooms and we were watching them both and an eyewitness in each courtroom said, that's the person. Without more, we really have no way of knowing, are they both right? Are they both wrong? Or is number one right and number two wrong or vice versa? That's a remarkable admission and it is clearly the truth. This is just to show you that another set of data confirm eyewitnesses often get it wrong. Um, you heard about lineups or identification procedures that are called sequential. And you had an explanation that sequential procedures are probably, if not definitely, the better approach you look at suspect number one and say, that's the guy or that's not the guy. And then suspect number one disappears. You look at suspect number two, that's the person or not. And you're not doing that back and forth comparison. But please look at where it says identification of fillers. In lineups, almost 31% of the time, even with the better run lineups, witnesses picked a person who clearly was not the criminal, what we call the fillers, the extra people in the lineup. So we know, and these are from actual studies of real lineups in real police departments, that lots of time people doing their best get it wrong. And some of that, but not all of it, correlates with race. From the first 180 DNA cases, the race of the victims was primarily Caucasian, white. The race of the perpetrator was a majority African American. So we have this confounding problem that some people call own race bias, some people call cross race bias, that we're dealing with issues where the way we grow up and the way we look at people and focus on certain features makes it easier or harder to make correct identifications. So there's the question. Right? If you've ever watched the movie, My Cousin Vinny, My Cousin Vinny is a great lawyer in the movies. And he shows that all the eyewitnesses, there were three, were wrong. Well, that's Hollywood. But the question is, do trials live up to My Cousin Vinny? So I'm going to start with before you get to the courtroom. Uh, we've heard a lot today about lineups. Not all identification procedures are done in lineups or in a quiet police office where they're sitting you down and saying, please look at these six photos. And we've learned today that even those procedures may not be the most neutral or objective. They may be what we call suggestive. But our court system also tolerates what are called show-ups. A show up is when one police officer, a group of police officers gets one suspect and puts them face to face with one eyewitness. Well, when you're the only suspect, there's no one else to compare to. And there's a problem that people might think, well, the police caught this guy, it must be them. 
So a system problem that precedes going to trial is that some of the police investigation processes, and there are good reasons to use show ups, at least in some cases, run a higher risk of mistake. Then there's something called suppression. Suppression is a term we teach in law school and when we train young lawyers and judges. To suppress evidence means to ask a judge, keep this evidence out of the case. If my car was illegally searched, even if they found something very incriminating like drugs, I could ask a judge, please suppress that evidence because my rights were violated. Well, we actually have suppression motions for bad eyewitness identifications. And you might say, okay, great, that will fix everything. I'm afraid it won't. Why? Um, all of the science or the great majority of the science you heard about today was developed after the early 1970s. Eyewitness science research has been going on since the early 1900s, more than 100 years. But the great bulk of it and the really precise um, forms of it took place after 1970. Well, we have a problem. When the United States Supreme Court designed its test for when judges should suppress eyewitness identifications, it was right at the beginning of the 1970s before most of this research was done. So the court did its best to create a suppression test. And it basically came up with a bunch of factors where it asked the ultimate question, is this identification reliable? But those factors are actually not based on good science. And in the federal courts and in most of the state courts, that bad test is the test that rules until today. Okay. What is this? This is a photo lineup, what we call a photo array, where the perpetrator wore a mask and only the eyes were visible. I don't believe anyone in the world can look at this and say, oh, those are the eyes of my robber but there are reported cases where photo arrays like this have been used and where the result was not suppressed, including a case in Texas. So that test, even though it sounds good on paper, doesn't screen out an awful lot of questionable or bad eyewitness identifications. Then we get to trial. Well, maybe trial will fix things. Well, the first problem is that trials are run. I realize we think judges run trials, but in terms of the presentation of evidence, trials are run by the lawyers. And too many lawyers don't know science and don't know the first thing about investigating eyewitnesses. The picture you see in the front of the picture is a barber shop where it says open. Um, a murder happened down the block from the barber shop. If you look down the picture, uh, you can see someone wearing a shirt like mine, light blue. It may have been the same shirt because you'll see that that's me. It was on the other side of that street corner that the murder happened. Some guys came out of the barber shop and they looked down the block because there was a commotion and they saw a murder and they identified a man named Doncha. Doncha went to jail. Doncha's lawyer and the prosecutor never went to this scene and took photographs. I had to do that years later working with a, a local innocence project to prove you can see faces from that distance.
That's where the witness was. It was actually behind there that that's where the crime happened. Now, there was other evidence, luckily, to exonerate Doncha, but a tremendous failure was that of lawyers. And Doncha's case is not alone. This is a murder case where a man's in jail, where the witness was inside the house where this railing is on the front porch of, and looked outside and said, I saw a guy walking down the street wearing a hoodie. His lawyer, the police, the prosecutor, never stood where that witness was and looked. I had to hire an investigator to go do it. And the photo you see was taken at seven in the evening. The crime happened at two in the morning. So when you have lawyers who don't understand eyewitness science, who don't do the basic investigation, you will have an unreliable result. And the law, and it may be right, but we should be cautious about this, says as long as the eyewitness says that's the guy or that's the person, that is enough to convict and that conviction will not be overturned on appeal even if this person had earlier made misidentifications. A jury is entitled to believe that word with zero corroboration and even with a past history of pointing out other people. There is no scientific support for that, but that's our law. Well, how about experts? Um, I think we're down to a situation where almost all of the 50 states and most or all of the federal courts allow an expert, like the expert you just heard, to come in and explain how memory works, how perception works, how police processes can help preserve memory or distort it. But number one, what their job is to give basic education. They never talk about, well, this witness is wrong and that may be proper, but they say, well, look, here's how memory works. There are only two problems. There aren't enough experts in the country to fill even a modest percentage of the courts that have eyewitness cases and they cost money. So yes, there's a possible fix with experts, but it surely isn't a complete one. Well, how about jury instructions? And there have been some pluses. Um, uh, several states now require judges to give instructions that educate the jurors about all the science you just heard. Um, there's a problem. I don't know if you've ever watched a jury trial. But at the end, the judge reads instructions for 45 minutes. Think what it's like in a classroom when a teacher or a professor speaks to you for 45 minutes without PowerPoints, without little videos. So it's mixed in with a whole bunch of other legal jargon. And it's at the end of trial, after people may have already formed their own decisions. So again, it's an improvement, but it's not a remedy. So do we give up? No, I don't wanna say give up because happily a lot of education is going on. And I think there's some other positives. Um, some courts are doing more. so. I'm from Pennsylvania, it took decades and decades, but our courts went from no experts to experts. Uh, New Jersey, Oregon, Massachusetts, New Mexico, just a few weeks ago, um, have changed their suppression laws to make them more in line with science. So slowly we're seeing courts using the modern science to say, we can do better. And to me, what is really important is that police are adopting the better practices. They're not doing it uniformly. 
they're not always getting the best training, but the more and more that police do the better and best practices, the more we'll avoid the risk of having somebody, the wrong person, be in front of a jury, where sometimes it feels like it's just a flip of a coin. So eyewitness testimony is important. In the right circumstances, it might be valuable, but it is fraught with risks. And our court system is not well designed to figure out which eyewitnesses are right and which are mistaken. Thank you so much. Here we go. So my question to you is this. I've come at this as a lawyer. I'm not a trained psychologist. I don't do eyewitness research in the lab like you do. But as a lawyer, I've studied this. I've written articles and book chapters, and I've testified in court about this, and I've trained judges and lawyers and prosecutors and even police officers and students. Um, and I've been a lawyer in eyewitness identification cases. So I've got this perspective of the court system, but you're the scientist. Does what I said um, coincide with what all your research has taught you? Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Um, I've learned um, to appreciate many of the points that you're making, all of the points you're making. Um, since in recent years, I've become a, a, a consultant and, and testified in, at trial or uh, more, more commonly at suppression hearings. And the frustration of... Um, of having a case where the, the eyewitness evidence is so poor and, and you know, you, I, I tailor what I say to help the court understand all of the risks involved and still the judge will, for, you know, reasons that maybe you understand better than I do, say, well, we're going to let the jury see this information. And sometimes I'm allowed to testify and sometimes I'm not. It's, you know, kind of that, well, the attorneys have to handle this. We don't need an expert at trial. But it, it's, yeah, it's just not, the suppression hearings just don't work other than to the best I can. I try to educate the attorney that I'm working for to build the arguments to use in, at trial. It, it's just, it's so frustrating. And am I correct that <laughs> lawyers really need that education? Yes. 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 And, I, you know, I've worked with um, a, a fair, fair number of attorneys, and some of them know so much. I mean, like you, like uh, the attorneys that work out of the Innocence Project, whatever, they, they know this material backwards and forwards. And so the, it's just a joy to work with them. Um, other attorneys are completely new to this. You know, I, you know, they call and they say, I got your name from someone else who I got your name, I got your name, I got your name or whatever. And I've got an eyewitness and, and it's cross race. They usually start, it's cross race. And, and then as you delve into the case, you realize, uh, sometimes you realize, well, no, it's nothing, <laughs> nothing I can help with. But, but other times it's, it's just phenomenal that they were not recognizing, as, as you talked about in your segment, they were not recognizing the importance of well, what really was the distance and the lighting, you know, that most basic phenomenon. And then all the way that, to document the witness ex, witnesses experience of, you know, going on the internet. Well, I found him on the internet and then I called the police and then that same picture was in the photo array and it's just, whoa, you, you see one problem after another. Um, and sometimes it's, um, uh, problems with the police procedures. Other times the police are, are, are doing their best job, but the witnesses are kind of going rogue. <laughs> but it, it all kind of um, accumulates into a mess. So we were asked on the break when we interrupted recording for a minute, is there anything that can move things forward? So I would like to ask you, 
Um, how have you been received or have you had opportunities to do judicial education? And if you have, how have you been received? I have um, had opportunity to do to um, lecture to judges. And in fact, in Minnesota, the Minnesota Supreme Court put together a eyewitness evidence committee for the purpose of trying to figure out how they might better deal with eyewitness um, evidence. And to, they, the committee was supposed to come up with recommendations kind of across the board as best they could. Um, and I put together a webinar for all the judges in the state of Minnesota that they are apparently supposed to all watch. Um, but I'm not sure that, that yet there's been a change in policy or legal, I don't know what you would call it, legal practice. Or, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't see that change yet. I just know that, well, they're supposed to learn the science, but. Okay, but, but at least. But then at what? Least, but then what? Least. I'm throwing the question back to you, just, but then what? So they know the science, but does that help in terms of suppression hearings, in terms of experts in court? In Minnesota, it's rare that an expert gets into court. I think I was one of the few in recent years who got to court and, and but the case was so egregious <laughs> and that fellow was acquitted, but, um, but they don't often allow experts. So the experiences I've had and I've taught judges around the United States um, through the National Judicial College and um, other entities is they learn a lot. Their hands are somewhat tied by the current suppression law or the trial law. I suspect it makes at least some judges a little more cautious, a little bit more careful in jury instructions, maybe a little bit more careful in making sure a prosecutor doesn't overstate certain evidence, um, but that's what I'll, I'll come back to. And I know a lot of your work is in this area. Please fix it with the police, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Do the investigation up front and the correction up front um, because at the end of the day, we're rolling the dice. And, and I'll finish up with the story I told you before we began. So today is December 9th. A couple of weeks ago, it was Thanksgiving. And I got to spend this Thanksgiving with a man whose trial I lost 30 years ago as an eyewitness case. And it took 29 years to exonerate him. And I got to go visit him a couple of mornings before Thanksgiving and just make sure he was doing okay and that he and his family could have a Thanksgiving dinner. Um, those mistakes still happen. Mm -hmm. uh, it takes a long time to fix them, and it's not always fixable. Mm -hmm. there, there's something else that I've noticed in recent cases, and, and obviously the cases that, that get called to my attention may be a small slice. You know, you don't, you don't know about that if the calls you're getting are, are the tip of the iceberg or whether they're just anomalies. But what I see is that even jurisdictions that have these good policies, the police slip and, and, that, and then that goes to trial and it's thought, well, this is just good investigative procedure. So for example, a, a case in which the, a, a wonderful, well done sequential double blind lineup was done by a, a you know, a blind administrator and, and the, the witness went through the lineup twice and said, oh, no, 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 no. I, I don't recognize any of these people. I don't, I don't, I don't. And then done. So then the lineup was over, the double blind administrator left. And then the case detective came in <laughs> and spread out the, the photos on the table and said, does anyone even look close? And from there led to, well, that one's closest. And that, you know, it could be, could be him or whatever. And, you know, before you know it, this guy is, is off to be convicted on the basis of that eyewitness. And so, so the, the problem is that, and then, and the judge says, well, it sounds like good investigative practices. You know, you want to, 
well, fine, did any of those pictures ring a bell? And, and of course, I witnessed scientists are going, no, no, you don't. <laughs> You got your answer and you should stop there because that relative judgment is going to kick in exactly right now. But so what did, so, so we have a whole new realm of research and work to do in the area of, and I've started on some of this, how can you mess up a double blind sequential lineup with subsequent good investigative practices? You can undermine even the good practices that, that they've been taught. Oh my. Oh my. All right. So Mark, <laughs> that's our uh, post-game wrap up. <laughs> you want to well, join let us? Me take, let me take just a minute and ask at least one more question to the two of you. What do you see for the future? Is this just a situation where there's a broken system and it's going to stay relatively broken and we're just trying to nibble around the edges to make it a little bit better? Or um, do you see a time when, when we're doing a better job of using the science, of giving people like Nancy an opportunity to testify in cases when her testimony would be useful and giving a jury a chance to hear that testimony and take that into account? What's the future hold? All right, I'll, I'll start from the law and then you wrap it up, Nancy. How's that? All right, as best All right. I can. So uh, there are a number of positive signs. One I talked about before, which is more and more training of police. Um, obviously, technology can help a little, right? Uh, more security cameras, things like that. They don't always get the clearest images. And I have one case where somebody picked out a security camera photo and they were wrong right? But there's more technology. Um, clearly, DNA and the more police look for what we call persuasive extrinsic evidence is going to make it better. Um, what are sometimes called progressive district attorney's offices, offices that have conviction integrity units, that have in-house training on eyewitness identification, that bring in people like Nancy and me to actually talk about here are the risks um, that adopt policies that, for example, we won't prosecute one witness stranger on stranger crimes where there's no corroboration. Uh, so there are some movements. At the end of the day, we have an imperfect system. The more we try and fix it, the better, but there will always be imperfections. But I do see some positives, and I, I will add this, right? We're about to have a new president take office. Um, when President Obama was in office, um, the Obama Justice Department issued guidance for federal prosecutors and federal law enforcement on better practices in eyewitness cases. Um, I hope those will be strengthened that we'll again have a Department of Justice. So as a national leader, um, sort of setting the tone. So mild optimism is my take. Nancy? <laughs> I agree with that. I tend to be an optimist as well, despite what, what I see. And uh, maybe pick up on a, two, a couple of themes. One is you're right that the video recording that is, that is so important. And, and as a consultant, I'm watching more and more body cams where you get the eyewitnesses first verbalizations to police, you know, whether it's 911 or with a body cam who says, this is what he looked like. This is what I know. This is the view I had, et cetera. That's so helpful to try and understand the phenomenon. Also the, the audio visual or uh, the, uh, video recordings of the entire interview with the eyewitness and the procedures is so important. Although I, I'd also say that the reason that I know about these problems of the investigated, investigator that puts all the pictures on the table or whatever is because it was videotaped. <laughs> but at least you can then have something that, and the attorney has something to go into court and say, look at the progression of this eyewitness experience, how 
the eyewitness said, no, don't recognize, no, no, no. And then, you know, it, so it's, it's, it's visual. It's, it's more information for the triers of fact, and that's got to be useful. The other thing that maybe I can just mention is that um, just recently, eyewitness scientists came out with a white paper yes. uh, that was published in the journal um, Law and Human Behavior, which, which was quite a, um, an endeavor in which they came up with additional recommendations for police practice based on uh, their agreement, the consensus of the eyewitness scientists. And that's very a very important step because it allows the scientific world, but also attorneys and judges or whatever to say, this is what we agree on. This is, th this shouldn't, we, sh we don't need to argue about this anymore. <laughs> this is what we agree on. And hopefully judges, as they think about what's to be allowed, um, will take that into consideration. What are some of those points of agreement, Nancy? Um, the uh, starting with um, uh, a reasonable, what's the phrasing they use? Reasonable suspicion to even do a lineup. The idea being that 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 a lineup is so inherently dangerous for an innocent suspect that police really should have more than just a hunch. You know, more than just well, it was a liquor store robbery, and this guy has been known to do liquor store robbery, so let's throw them in a lineup. But rather, there must be some additional piece of evidence before you even put a person in a lineup. Now, um, and, and Jules will know more about the legal ins and outs of something like that, but the idea is we have to make police understand that just putting someone's photo in an array or putting someone in a lineup as, as a first step in the investigation is, is in the wrong order. That in fact, there should be evidence suggesting that this person really did this before, before using this, this dangerous technique. Um, there are among the recommendations, uh, recommendations about uh, show ups, Jules talked about, you know, how, how inherently dangerous um, for an innocent suspect to show up, a, a police show up can be on the street and, and how uh, one can tamp down some of the hot cues, if you will, some of the very suggestive cues with show ups, information about when interviewing witnesses um, up front, get, um, I guess I mentioned this earlier, find out what, what do they at the time of the first interview feel, um, were they paying attention? Did they have a good view? Were they able to make out features of the face, et cetera? Is this a stranger or a known person? Because those are the kinds of pieces of eyewitness memory that change across time. They be, the confidence inflates. And as the con, this is one of the most robust findings in the eyewitness literature that as the witness um, learns more about the case, that this person oh, was identified by another co-witness, or this person has committed other crimes, or this person has been arrested, confidence grows, which is damaging enough, as I mentioned in the webinar. But, um, but also what changes is the witness's memory. The witness begins to logically think, this is the way it, you know we put together our narratives about, well, I identified the right person, so I must have seen his face. So I must have had a good view. So I must have been paying attention because otherwise how would I have possibly identified this person from the lineup? And so the, the narrative of the witness changes across time. And so that's why that narrative has to be captured early on to, to be able to say, no, no, no. At the time you said you didn't have a good view. At the time you said, you know, you were looking at your cell phone when he should, <laughs> when the guy approached. So there are, all, there are those kinds of recommendations that become very important, lineup structure, lineup delivery, et cetera. And if I may add a couple of things, when you get that information early and you learn the witness didn't get a good look and wasn't paying so much attention, it might be the wake up call to the police saying we should investigate more. Right. And if you put the, the victim or the witness in a lineup where you have no real basis to think Jules Epstein did it, but well, he's done stuff like this before, so let's put him in. 
and they pick jewels and it turns out they're wrong. Besides the harm it does to jewels, you've now burned a complete eyewitness. Right. Because when the real person gets caught, the first question that witness is going to be asked, you picked out Jules Epstein. You picked out somebody else. So it has repercussions down the lane. And of course, stops the police from continuing their investigation. So the white paper, and I can say as a lawyer and a researcher, legal researcher, I've read it a number of times and tried to encourage other people to read it. It is really important. And given the the names of, of the people, right, the co-authors, they are from mm-hmm. across the spectrum of eyewitness researchers and include at least one who is often called by prosecutors. Right. So it's, if you're going to talk about a consensus document, this is it. And that mm-hmm. gives it added power. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you both. Um, you know, this is an important subject and we try, we, 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 we have a criminal justice system in which we want to have confidence and, and we want to be able to, to feel as though it's a system that works well. And, and we know that there are occasions when somebody who is not guilty um, is convicted and, and you've helped us understand why that happens, what we can do to help make it less likely to happen in the future. And, and it's part of a, of a learning process that we hope our audience is, uh, is engaged in right now. And, and thank you for contributing to, mm-hmm. to, uh, to the knowledge that we have to share. Thank you both very much. Well, thank you. Welcome.